Welcome to the Enclave series. Um, very happy to see so many people in the gallery. And again, our apologies for muting people. It's one way we can prevent the worst Zoom bombing. And uh, I'm going to tell you who about a few news uh, Enclave series events coming up in June. And then I'm going to introduce Ray, who will introduce Ron. So welcome especially to Ron. Okay, um, we are at the end of the May series, thanks to Ron, our last reader. We change both password and Zoom address in June. Uh, if anyone wants to be on our email to get this, we usually try to restrict the Zoom address as well as the password to email only. So you would need to know somebody, either Ray, me, Charles, or Ron, uh, who might pass that information on to us. Okay, so next month we start off with Ed Roberson, uh, then John Yao, next Bob Perelman, and last, Lainey Brown. We have some July readings coming up and possibly uh, may extend into either August or the fall. We're still kind of juggling that. But for sure on the docket will be Peter Gizzi, Joseph Donahue, Lisa, Lisa Walsack. And at some point, Ray and I are going to do a joint reading, but we're still trying to figure out quite how to juggle a few more events into the series. As long as we see lots of people coming, got great participation this time, uh, we will try to continue the Enclave series. All events are Sundays at one o'clock Pacific time, four o'clock East Coast time. So I'm going to briefly introduce Ray, who needs no introduction. Uh, she, her, her, she does have a forthcoming book, which you may not know about yet, Conjure. Uh, this follows on her preceding book, Wobble, and they're both out from Wesleyan. Ray is an emeritus professor from UC San Diego. And some, somewhere back there, she was a Pulitzer Prize winner, although she doesn't tend to bring that forth in her bio for various reasons, but I thought I'd bring it up this time. So Ray, um, to introduce our reader, thank you. Thanks, Jean. It's my pleasure to introduce Ron Silliman, whom I've known forever, or, <laughs> since, or since 1969, whichever came first. He was a mentor to me when I arrived in the Bay Area. Though young, he seemed relatively seasoned in the ways of poetry and the poetry world. Unlike most poets we know, Ron has not worked primarily in academia. He has been a community activist working in the prison reform movement and running writing workshops for the homeless in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. For a time, he was the editor of the Socialist Review. He is also Conversely, worked in marketing. Currently, he is an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where he recently received their award for innovative teaching. As most of you know, Silliman is an influential poet and thinker associated with the language poetry movement. He has published over 40 books of his own poetry. Wow, that's amazing. Most recently, a bilingual English-Italian edition of his piece, The Chinese Notebook, translated by Massimiliano Manganelli. Along the way, he picked up a couple of NEAs, a Levinson Prize from Poetry Magazine, and a fellowship from the Pew Center for the Arts. Silliman, I'm gonna call you by your last name, Ron, sometimes since I know you're <laughs> but Silliman is the editor of the Seminal Language Poetry Anthology in the American Tree the first such anthology, and the author of an important collection of essays called The New Sentence. Um, 
in the title essay of that, the title essay of that book argued that the realism effect in conventional narrative is akin to the commodity fetish as defined by Marx. It also outlined the characteristics of a new style of long prose poem then being written in the Bay Area by Silliman and some of his fellow language poets. In a new sentence work, each sentence is an autonomous unit, a poem in itself, if you will, which nonetheless fits into the overall tonal field of the whole. In fact, if I had to characterize Ron's work, and I do, I would say that he is a master of the productive tension, the dance between part and whole. And his holes can be enormous indeed. His book-length poem, Ketchak, is written in a series of paragraphs where each contains twice as many sentences as the one before. So it's an example of that exponential growth we've been hearing so much about lately. Um, half of the sentences are new, half repeated, thus recontextualized, and sometimes expanded. As far as I know, at the time Ketchak was published, no one had used a form like that before. Um, it turns out, though, that the poem Ketchak is only one small part of the multi-book project, also called Ketchak, which, when complete, will is supposed to comprise Ron's life work. So, so to say that Ron plans ahead is an understatement. He is an architect. I admire Ron's inventive use of form, but it is something else that draws me back to his work again and again. No one pays attention to the world as intimately and acutely as Silliman. Often he is paying attention to people in their social contexts in public spaces. One repeated and eventually embellished sentence in Ketchak is, the nurse, by a subtle shift of weight, moves in front of the student to more rapidly board the bus. I don't know about you, but I've done that. I had a, you talking about me moment when I read that? Well, <laughs> I've done that while trying to board, if not a bus, then a plane or whatever. And I thought no one noticed, but Ron looks, noticing things that others might not. I guess one might say that Ron's work is about making acts of attention shapely. He hasn't stayed entirely with his new sentence prose poem. He's since written quite a few poems in lines, in verse, I put that in scare quotes. Um, a couple of those are a toner, which is included in his long opus, The Alphabet, and Revelator, which is the first poem in his final, because enormous, um, ongoing project, Universe. Whatever form he uses, though, the quality of his attention remains the same. Here are a couple of quickly chosen quotes from Toner, which I turn to kind of thumbing through the alphabet. Um, On the street, a woman returns a man's leer in voluntary grimace. I know I've made that grimace sometime, somewhere, without really thinking about it. Both of the quotes I pulled out now are about what Claudia Rankin has taught us to call microaggressions, subtle or not so subtle exercises in power. This is not to say that Ron's lines and sentences all focus on that topic. Voices can also enter these texts from oblique angles. Also on the first page of Toner are the lines, I don't want to get my feathers hot. I'm having fun trying to imagine who or what could possibly say that. Ron is always experimenting. One of his several works in progress is American Songbook. I think he plans to read from that today. And as I think you'll see, this poem, American Songbook, is more topical and more explicitly political than his previous work. It also draws on a range of popular song. So take it away, Ron. Thank you. Um, today is the 201st birthday of Walt Whitman. And uh, it's also the 81st birthday of uh, former uh, California poet laureate Al Young, who 
somebody I, I used to give readings with as many as 55 years ago on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. And so he's still still around. He's been uh, he's getting to see his uh, son today for the first time in uh, three months. What with the lockdown, um, Al's been in a uh, board and care home, not the safest place to be since suffering a major stroke last year. So I'm thinking of him on his birthday as well. Before I begin, I want to read um, four lines from Walt Whitman that I think speak to uh, George Floyd. I think of this as a prayer. Unscrew the locks from the doors. Unscrew the doors themselves from their jams. Whoever degrades another degrades me. And whatever is done or said returns to me at last. I knew I was going to get emotional. I'm going to actually do something that's a little unusual today um, in that I'm going to read a number of works that are not part of this long life work project because they predate it before I could then get into some of my very most recent work. Um, and uh, I'm in the process, rather slowly, I I fear, of pulling together a selected early poems, tentative title, Wet Loom Star, that I plan to send off at some point to an unnamed press in the American Southwest. Um, and this might very easily be the first poem in that uh, collection. It's something that I wrote when I was... 20, 21 years old, and sent to Poetry Magazine, which uh, then in turn accepted it. Henry Rago was somebody whom I had sent work to previously when I was a teenager, and he'd been kind enough to actually send back actual notes when he rejected those earlier things, um, absolutely none of which he should have accepted. Um, but by 1966, I was already into what I think of now as my Robert Kelly phase, very much taken with the works of Kelly from the 1960s. Um, things, books like Finding the Measure and 20 Songs and Acts and Dendron Tree. Uh, one of the great uh, three book runs uh, in American poetry and too little known, especially Acts and Dendron Tree. Anyway, this poem came out of that particular engagement, and um, when Rago accepted it, he was about to go on a sabbatical from Poetry Chicago, and um, because he was only going to be gone a short time, they didn't do a, a major search to find a replacement, simply asked a local adjunct uh, if he would just sort of you know, filled the chair while Henry was out of town. Unfortunately, Henry had a heart attack and died. And the uh, temporary replacement, Daryl Hine, who was a Canadian paleoformalist, was not nearly as open to different kinds of poetry as Henry Rago had been. Henry Rago had a 14-year run as editor of, of poetry, and for the first seven years, he too was a very traditional editor. But then in the last seven years, he opened up to the likes of Charles Olson, Ronald Johnson, and um, the New American Poetry in general. Um, so when Daryl Hine took over, I was not sure that my poem was ever going to see the light of day, but 
uh, Daryl figured out a system of using the summer months to flush, and that's probably the exact word he thought of, um, these works that had been accepted by his predecessor through. So when in June of 1969, this poem appeared in poetry, uh, I was there as a debut poet with uh, Mitchell Goodman, who at the time was the uh, husband of Denise Levertoff, and with Larry Eigner. So I, it was an auspicious uh, grouping there as far as I was concerned. Anyway, I'd forgotten about this poem. It's been on the poetry website, the only place you can find it. It's never been in any book of mine uh, until a Greek translation of it was published about a year ago. And um, so that brought it back to me and, and it has made me uh, think about it. I don't know if I've ever read this before. So it, it's fairly old in those terms. Cast flesh as the song into the room is cast holy. No man wanders life untouched. If I lie, it is the sadness in me that is refusal. If it is the city life, no matter. There are walkways, paths between gardens and into gardens. There is even the center in the night built upon silence. The violins I never understand or the flutings, such narrowness of caution, pitch. Books are real, they can drown. How in the harbor the moon is enough, how the street is plenty. These fine walls we give to the buildings, the windows built therein. And then this next work is another work that I'm sure I've never read. Uh, in public. It's my first book, uh, Three Syntactic Fictions for Dennis Schmitz. And it was published by Bloodrunner Press, very 60s name that, um, in a large edition of 11 copies, uh, each typeset on a typewriter by uh, David Perry. And there's a story uh, behind this one as well. Dennis Schmidt was a poet in Sacramento, California, taught at Sacramento State, who was a friend of mine, uh, only poet I have ever met, actually, who did not have books in his house. I think he kept them all in his office on campus, which means he either had a very large office or a fairly trim collection. Um, Dennis and I were two of five poets picked by, po uh, not by poetry, um, by the Chicago Review with the idea that they were going to promote the heck out of us. Uh, and that as, as we all became world famous, it would reflect positively back on the Chicago Review. This was back in the days when Ivan Lurie was the poetry editor, the younger brother of Richard Lurie of Hanging Loose Press, and Eugene Wildman, an experimental novelist, was the general editor. And like even for the best um, university magazine in the country, this is an idea they held firmly with until their tenure as the editors of that journal uh, ended, which meant essentially one year. But the five of us all sort of got to at least meet one another uh, remotely, and Dennis and I became friends, as did Robin McGowan and I. Robin taught at Berkeley. Uh, and Michael Anania, who I'm still in touch with, and William Hunt were the other two, five cisgender white men, very 60s model here. I thought Dennis was an interesting poet because he captured both a traditional model for writing that I, in retrospect, I think may have its roots in the work of uh, Archie Ammons, but in which I saw um, some kinship to what Larry Eigner had been doing. Uh, so I wrote these three poems for him. The first one is has a title uh, from another uh, Robert Kelly student, uh, John Gorham, who was at uh, Berkeley, man I met Thomas Mayer through. Um, and um, 
this poem also is the only place in my work uh, where there is a symbol, in this case, a cross um, underneath the word pocket and next to the word uneasy um, to sort of represent the ineffable. So um, it's an, a little unusual for that. Ideas always die, and thank God for that. John Gorham misquoted. He confused acquaintance thought variations enough. Love also spent dollars in the pocket pool was uneasy. The charts, the pages, the maps of the old boats he thought to swim years before the mast felled him. It was calligraphy. It was actually my great grandfather who was felled when he fell from a mast. The next one is entitled, Poem for Two Voices Where a Forest Fire Takes the Place of the Death of Robert F. Kennedy. And the reference here is not to the Berkeley firestorm of 1991, obviously. This was written in 1968. Um, nor to the a uh, firestorm that burned down behind the Durant Hotel in 1970, but one started in Tilden Park in 1923, and because at that point cities didn't cooperate with one another, um, Berkeley called Orinda and told them that part of their woods were on fire, but Arinda thought, well, that's not blowing in our direction of any of our town, so we don't need to go fight it. And by the time it got over to Grizzly Peak Boulevard and started heading down the Berkeley Hills, it was way beyond what the city of Berkeley could handle, and it basically wiped out everything um, uh, east of uh, Chez Panisse. Um, so um, that was a lesson. And that also caused the uh, cities to begin cooperating on fire calls. Poem for two voices where a forest fire takes the place of the death of Robert F. Kennedy. The hill the houses in front of fire he saw the afternoon was the best winds high and white smoke the emptiness the streets the engines had her drama he said nothing of her asking denial was not work as silence of the plum trees giving up poison of the fuels he remembered what they put in houses Darling, did you hear of all that he heard at the window, what the radio said? He could not stop staring. A lot of references there to a great uncle of mine who did fight that fire. Three, and this one shows, I think, the uh, um, influence of John Wieners, uh, who I was obviously reading at the time. Poem for those who get caught. The deceivers and fools, the morning it was called, the lovers, the train turned over, their lives secret and once for real. I forget the newspapers, the dark print in the snow, the tunnel. They came out of the identification, the radios played their names, the rails took on gestures. I do not forget the dead, eyes like the rain on the pages, the passage, the shadows and syntax of laughter. That, anyway, is the entire book. Now I'm going to go before I get into work from universe, the very last two poems that I wrote before I started Ketchak. The first is a homophonic translation of Rilke for David Melnick, and it's called, Do We Know Ella Cheese? Where, when it scree hurt as much, then how's their angle or known gun? Honky set selves, his name a einer much. Plows lick answers, each fucking a fun sign in, starker in design. Dent is seen as niche, all's this wreck leak and hand thing. Then fear not, grotto or ray gun, and were bewunder, and as so vile as gay lass and first maid, and so's her story. And yet her is shred click. 
and is overhauled each much. Dan and verse look Eden lock rough. Done killinch? Look then, ach, then form again, fear then zoo broken? Angle niche, mention niche. Undefined again, her American is shown. Toss furniture for lace lick, zoo house sin. Her good day to tan felt. It's plied ounce we like. Oregon dumbominum, aha, uh-huh. the sphere and day clique, feeders anus ply buns, distrust to forecaster, and thus, for so long, a true sign I nor gay phone had, dare a spy once go feel, unsupplied sea and king niche. O oh, anti knock, thy knock, fender fin fuller felt rum, and some on gay six sort, vamply be seen each, dear Santa. Sun's tint agenda, welch it, a mind sell none. Her sin, moosome before state. Is he then leaping and lighter? Ha, see, furtive in such enormity, nine dear earlobes, vice stews, notch niche, fair foes, then harm and heal ear. Suit and broom and zoo, the fear at men feels like dusty fugal, the air white art. A loft fool emitting a game fugue. Yacht, he free, linger, broke tan dishful, is mute eating muncher, stern at her zoo, thus do seize birdies. Is hopsicle no vogue or heron, in fur gagging on odor, dative, or overcome steam, go off not in fence, dear. And this poem, Uh, This poem actually got mentioned uh, online earlier this week. Bill Bill Moore published a review of um, The Alphabet, I believe it was, in which he talked about how wonderful The Alphabet was. And it was in contrast to to Berkeley that uh, he made that comment, which he had seen in Michael Lawley's anthology, uh, none of the above uh, back in 1976. Um, and um, he hadn't thought there that much of this poem. So uh, I, on the other hand, like it quite a bit. It was something that um, came to me when I was reading an interview of Robert Creeley in Vancouver. And he I, says sort of like place in the interview, but they captured it and put it in that he, he says, I'm tired and want to stop this mumbling, which is his characterization of the, of the interview. Um, and I thought, oh, that's fabulous. I have to figure out how to use that. And then since I'd been talking with Kathy Acker a lot at that point about the construction of character, I wanted to see if I could create an eye out of finding uh, sentences that used an I, and I literally was sitting at a desk. Uh, I was living on Sacramento Street in San Francisco. Ray was living on that street as well. Ronald Johnson was just a bit further down um, and on the same side as I was. And I just literally would start to turn around and grab things hither and yon and thumb through them. And if I found something with an I, Um, I would use it. And um, some of these you might recognize. There's Andre Malraux in here, for example, and there's an appallingly sexist eye in one of the things that comes literally out of Norman Mailer's Armies of the Night, um, actually from one of the passages where he's speculating what Denise Levertov might be like in bed. Um, you know, the kind of thing that Norman Mailer loved to do while talking about politics. Um, so I, I just put them all here together, and that's what this is. And it's entitled Berkeley. Uh, so and the reason you don't find a Berkeley in the alphabet is because it's here. I thought you might be here. I was alone, and it was almost two. 
I have enjoyed my lunch. I knew right away I made a mistake. I glanced back once. I mean it. I thought so. I had been actually invited. I drew my jacket sleeve across my wet mouth. I wasn't even trying. I told him, I'll try to let you know. I watched some piano lessons. I was a very tough cookie. I laughed. I thought I'd tell you. I haven't hurt him. I should be too vulgar. I know where I am. I do decline to be left. I haven't had the time. I'm going to find out about you. I never thought of that. I better have some of that wine. I'm serious. I hope so. I'm red and brown. I would take you to a balcony. I'd swear it. I know who you are. I knew there was something and opened the window. I went on up and unlocked the door. I went out and shut the door. I put the lamps out and sat by an open window. I sat down and looked at him. I sat down and took one of the cigarettes. I stepped inside the office and picked up the mail. I work there. I see. I changed my mind. I just feel that way. I want to be sick. I never said anything. I like this rug. I fuck too. I am a stride at a time. I came through the museum. I was not afraid. I could not save her. I fell asleep on the sand. I have reasons I'm not thinking yet. I don't care for the idea. I shake your hand and even embrace you. I've been wondering something else. I wish I could have missed it. I think she needs more time. I think we never used the word. I do. I know. I'll meet that. I knew no one in the place. I don't play well. I'm always willing. I have to go soon. I put out my hand. I believe it did. I'm glad you're at home. I asked him what might be his immediate purpose. I'd like to know the reasons. I could hear the many voices now. I'll tell you God's truth. I don't go at all anymore. I look behind me. I care not to perform this part of my task methodically. I survive myself. I'll try the bench here. I don't see how I can help you. I detest it. I want to see which side will grow best. I want to redeem myself. I can shoot you. I've no idea, really. I should say it is not a mask. I must remember another time. I don't want to know you. I'm not dressed. I had to take the risk. I did look. I don't care what you make of it. I'm outside in the sun. I still had what was mine. I will stay here and die. I was reinforced in this opinion. I flushed it down the toilet. I collapsed into my chair. I could go home still. I forget the place, sir. I closed my eyes so as not to see those apes. I said that it was all scattered. I met him through some friends. I saw the object itself. I left them. I thought you were different. I want not to have failed to say it. I began to beat the horse. I will never find happiness. I will not repair the hole in the window. I wish you at least a pleasant day. I don't say that it's me particularly. I knew now why her face was familiar. I play a little at it. I've rung them three times. I stood on my own two feet. I will see him there. I began to recognize where I am. I will tell you, I protest my innocence of these things. I only heard by accident. I tell you, all women are dead. I could hardly believe my own eyes. I could find nothing to say. I undertook to deliver the letters and the box. I would do the same. I'm going back with you. I shall keep the spot in sight. I can only speak for myself. I was impatient. I squeaked for joy. I agree with that. I close my eyes and think it over. I stick to dealing. I've had a long long time without selling it. I walked out the back way. I don't intend to do anything. I ain't leaving this machine. I liked her all right. I should like him to have a friend 
I'm only speaking the truth. I'm going around the corner. I ask you, I just don't want to eat. I answer, I didn't answer. I'm sorry, he said. I forgot to notice what brand it was. I see, the professor said. I tackled him this morning on belief. I'm afraid I am. I came to fetch him from his room in the morning. I do not No, about others. I am shivering. I opened the door. I wouldn't have wanted to try that myself. I got up and followed her into the study. I went out, walked a few steps to the front door. I wonder, he ever put it out of sight? I laughed, but it was not a gay sort of laughter. I can see the picture. I'm tired. Want to stop this mumbling. I won't stand for this. I'm unpopular everywhere because they expected you. I was a god. I wasn't speaking to you. I think you've got enough to do already. And from there to Ketchik is actually a very short jump. Um, In the alphabet, which is the third of the four sections of this larger project, Ketchak. There's a poem called VOG, which is an acronym that in the 1950s stood for the voice of God in TV scripts and now stands for voiceover guy, which shows you the secularization of uh, television over the past half century. Vogue is an attempt within uh, the alphabet to write a book of, quote, ordinary poems. Um, That same process sort of continues onward in American songbook uh, in the universe, about third to halfway through the construction of this section. And as as Ray indicated in the introduction, it's true that the uh, poems tend to be topical, although not the first group I'm going to read uh, so much, and that are often related to specific uh, political events of our time. I've always been uh, troubled by the fact that as a very slow writer, it can take me a decade to finish a poem, um, you know, when people ask for anti-war poems for this or that, uh, conflagration, I, you know, the war is over by the time I've written the poem. Uh, so um, fortunately for my poetry, not for the world, George Bush figured out a way uh, to solve that problem by simply starting wars that never end. Um, so this gives me an opportunity to think through these kinds of issues. And of course, the presidency of Donald Trump has given me a broader range of um, catastrophes and horrors to think about. So that is where, where this particular group is coming from. People who remember the Vogue section of the alphabet, those of you who've read it closely enough to write a dissertation on it, um, will note that the poems here are quite a bit different than the ones there. And it's true. I was actually surprised in the process of writing this to see how much my own idea of, quote, a normal poem uh, as a unit uh, would look. So some of you will have heard uh, the first group, and it's conceivable one or two of you will have heard the next thing I've read. And then after that, I'll be only reading things that I've never read before. So I'm going to begin with what was a, a chap book, a chaplet, not, a, not really a book. It was printed on a single piece of paper uh, by Happy Monks Press in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. Five poems I did not write. 20th century. Petals on a wet black bow beside the white chickens. 20th century. Petals on a wet black bow. So sweet and so cold. 20th century. Petals on a wet black bow, starving, hysterical, 
naked. 20th century petals on a wet black bow, they were a kind of solution. 20th century petals on a wet black bow, they never knew what hit them. This next poem is called Trade Mock. If I can get into the rhythm of this. How many tabs must a gob flick on when gender is just a thing? And how many gobs must a gal swish left to locate one what can sing? And how many jobs can a lifetime hold where one doesn't mean a thing? The answer, me lad, lies in capital accumulation and the production of luxury goods, demanding as they do a minimal number of well-heeled customers, stilettos in point of fact, and a maximum of margin, the better to ship offshore, Panama perhaps, or the Caymans, where the ones and O's don't count, and the 1040 is indeed EZ. So what is one to do sans abs fit for the catwalk, what with Terry Richardson's hand up your crotch and schlong somewhere even more personal, bend over, please. But flee the farm belt for Pakistan or the oil tanker slipping by the artificial islands off Dubai. No wonder sweet powder forms lines to the right side of a razor across the shine of a mirror where what you see looking down is not yourself, but that absence in an economy you get to fill just until we find someone cheaper. In West China, perhaps, or the Congo, or among the long legs of the Crimea, where girls themselves become luxury items with margins to match. But the sell-by dates tattooed on the snatch according to Batch better latch onto a banker or slumlord while you can. And that property is not intellectual, subject to age more than copyright. Work is just a phase. The reproduction of necessities remains a constant, not covered as they are by your health plan. And desire, what is that exactly? What was it to your mom when she was that age and not a skill to her name? Someone's to blame as if that did any good for the pain of live music to the inner ear. I can't hear you, but maybe I can read your lips. Blips passing in the light green of the screen, interpretable as targets before these burst, like flowers in stop time, or remembering not to forget the cannoli on the long ride home. This next one is called Contrast is Everything. Contrast is everything. We live to fuck and then we sing until the rent forces us out. Living on the street is hard until you figure just which yard is protected from a view. So twist this wire if you can until you've made a little man and he can live here too. He don't say much, but that's his charm. And you won't come to any harm to listen to him too. If only you had a tent for rain and something to ease this pain and possibly a little cane on which to chew. I dream my hands between your legs and then my lips and last my tongue until finally you've begun to arch your back and give a moan just as if we'd been sewn together into one. But that's for folks is have a room and a reason for this broom to push the dust out the door, worrying about the score. And if maybe just a little more might not have been too few. Bubbles come and bubbles burst, and nothing cures this awful thirst like sleep. But first, the man must have his due. The rhyme is wretched, and thus it's etched far beyond my capacity to fetch an X that's true. Social distancing from cable news is my Purell, standing in the welcome center's men's room, humming happy birthday as I rub frothy hands under a frigid tap. Dude, there's an app for that. 
or a plan swabbing my nostrils all dressed in hazmat. Atticus takes careful aim, a laser dot square on my forehead. Say cheese, Egon Sheila, half starved, dying of the Spanish flu. Walter Benjamin, dying of the Spanish border. Trump's official portrait as done by Artemisia Gentileschi. Here's another cheery little piece. Pocket full of rye. Rye is spelled W-R-Y. This little pig went to market. This little pig flew drones. This little pig published downloadable weaponry. This little pig foreclosed homes. And this little pig hiked the price of insulin until the body ate its own bones. And capital accumulates, capital accumulates, capital accumulates like a tumor, like a stone. Don't make diminutives of these yet-to-be-airbrushed generals on either side of Uncle Joe. History teaches that creature features are in fact scripted. First one billionaire, then many. Trillionaires are next, but eventually there's only one, at which point money itself goes up in smoke. How many millennia before that dust settles? This next piece, I have to give credit to um, Poetry Magazine once again, um, not only because it is going to appear there, but also because they were willing to forego their prohibition about um, putting a poem even orally on the internet before it's published in their journal on the grounds that this is the only way poets can read their um, works anymore. So I want to say thank you to Don Chair and the, the gang in Chicago. And it is called Shelter in Place. Putting the pox in apocalypse the pudding in the skull has a lovely taste, just a little, until you push through to the richer, almost bitter sweetness at the center. Yum is a corporate brand, encompassing multiple fast food franchise chains. He marched his co-workers out of the restaurant and into the woods where he shot them. The angel of death ambles in from the memory gardens. It merely needs to brush against the hem of your gown. Goya's peasants against the wall, don't look away. When help burst in all armored up, they found a naked woman alone in the showers but couldn't make out her mumbled song. When this you see DEF geometry rising to the surface of a hypothetical world in a 13-dimensional space circulating in absence where some sun should be, what time is it in Zaragoza by the old Roman wall? Modernism lurks, looking as dated as the gravel garden at the Soviet bloc apartments. She waits at the corner for the bus to campus when the mayor's son pulls up in his car to offer her a ride from which she is never seen again. The first to commit suicide is the class valedictorian. They ring from the bridge like a festival of ornaments, like the couple holding hands out of the South Tower. Nobody remembers Ishi in the Berkeley Hills or Lone Cat Fuller's musical contraption. Holy Hubert shouting from a text in which all of the words have been erased. And I'm going to close with something a little more traditional. Um, and um, it's titled Ode, beginning with the line by Sean Bonney. And it's sad that Sean Bonney died in the fall of last year because if ever there was a uh, year that made Sean Bonney's poetry not look like a dystopian exaggeration. It's 2020. Fuck this shit. My lawyer can eat your lawyer. 
over tea at three in a vast dining plaza, with chandeliered ceilings plus mirrors where the walls should be, Warren Harding upstairs puking his guts out to no avail, because scale is where it's at here on Dealey Plaza, the president's head snapping back as the bullet bursts the brain, and the curious slow-mo ballet the future Ms. Onassis performs, twisting to flee that moving vehicle until the service of secrets pushes her back off the trunk. Ah, that pillbox hat of history, having seen too much, will tell you very little. I rest my case. Fuck that shit. No source from the 1950s, back when the senator and Jackie live right across the street from Archibald Cox, estimates the number of publishing American poets at over 100. Though Poetry Chicago, as folks in those days, those days, loved to call it, prints over seven times that many in that decade alone. And seven of the 12 contributors to the first issue of Yugen, 1958, never once appeared in poetry, not even Jack Michelin. Prose arose as an emblem of reading, not what was in front of you, but something further back, dreamlike almost. Nightmare of the hidden hand carried forward as a headache one can't quite place. Throbby lobby, Augustine's lips, oh Gaspard of the night. Fuck this shit. In 1619, we took a little trip across the middle passage to pick crops in Mississippi because the calculus of labor demanded a solution that wouldn't price the resulting products of spun cotton beyond the means of the hoi polloi, the swells of midtown Manhattan, which in those days meant Gramercy Park, who were thus empowered to outlaw slavery while benefiting from its works. Blow my nose. Fuck this shit. That calculus, three-fifths in the Constitution, was not an estimate of any individual's worth. What, after all, is worth if you can whip, hang, shoot, or fuck it? Light it on fire just because you're feeling that way without warning. But was a pre the precise number required to afford the slaving states enough votes to counter any two-thirds majority? And the fix has been in ever since. Fuck this shit. Only one New Yorker signed that document, the Caribbean A. Ham, who am what he am, not what we imagine the stage more circular than the argument. The question at hand being by which index to gauge the state of the economy. We who are never standard and yet poor, war, a oh war, oh endless war, see what war has done to me. At the laser red glare, pundits brain on air, give proof through the night that capital's unfair. War, a oh war, a oh endless war, see what war has done to me. Fuck this shit. Give tanks that the wall does not fall on our heads. What glows in the dark stows in our beds. Freaking words of wisdom. Let it bleed. Let it bleed. Fuck this shit. What time do the hearings begin? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ron. That was terrific. Uh, great wonderful reading and uh, thank everyone for coming. Uh, Ray, if you want to say a couple of words before we leave, you'll need, okay. Hi, um, yeah, all right, I liked hearing that, especially your refrain, Ron. I'm gonna go around saying it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so it was a great, great reading. Thank you, Ron, thank everyone for being here. Uh, sorry that you're all muted. Come back next week, same time, uh, for Ed Roberson. And if I don't have you on our emails, please email me because usually the Zoom address 
and the password are only given through email. So hope to see you back next week. Again, super, Ron. Thanks. Yeah, thanks you all for coming.